Welcome everyone, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming uh, to the NHA Food for Thought lecture series. Um, well, this will be happening every Thursday throughout the fall until uh, November 19th. Uh, it's made possible in part by the MS Worthington Foundation and all of our multimedia support is made possible by Novation Media. So we'd like to thank those two organizations. Um, my name is Jacob Porton, I'm the Public Programs Coordinator. I'd like to invite you all to check out all of our future upcoming programs, NHA.org. Couple notes, please keep the cell phones silent for the duration of the event, and um, restrooms should you need them are right around the corner there. I want to give a little introduction to today's presenter, Leah Cabral. Uh, she is a nature lover who uh, works for the Town of Nantucket Natural Resources Department. She moved here to Nantucket after completing her master uh, or her Bachelor of Science at um, Eckerd College in 2009. Uh, she came with an internship at the Grant Point Shellfish Hatchery. She worked on the Bay Scallop uh, uh, Stock Program. And in 2014, she launched Nantucket's first shell recycling program. Is currently working towards reestablishing an oyster reef here in Nantucket waters. And we're going to learn more about that program today. Thank you all for coming and help me welcome Leah Cabral. Thank you, Jacob. So I'm going to talk to you today about the shell recycling program that was started in 2014. Um, the year of 2014 and 15 has been funded from the uh, Nantucket Shellfish Association, so I want to thank them. So, let's see. So I'm going to give a brief background about myself, um, where I came from where I went to school. I'll give a brief background about the Natural Resources Department, and then I'll go into the Shell Recycling Program and give you all the details about that and how it relates to oyster restoration. And there's a hatchery phase for oyster restoration, so I will explain that. And then some studies that we want to do before we actually put the reef into Nantucket waters, the permitting process, and then I'll end with oysters on Nantucket. So I grew up in Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. It's a small town off of Cape Cod. I have lived there my whole life. Um, it probably has the same population as Nantucket or even a little bit smaller. But I used to come out to Nantucket when I was, um, ever since I was a baby. My grandparents came here in the 50s and they built a cool cottage on Smith's Point. So I used to spend the summers there. My, both my parents spent their summers on Nantucket, and um, my grandfather used to own um, The Pines, which is now Fairgrounds Restaurant. So I have strong roots to Nantucket. I love this place. I love the small community. Um, so after high school, I graduated in 2005, I decided to go down to Florida, to Eckerd College, which is a small liberal arts school. It's um, in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I studied marine science, because I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I also minored in environmental studies as well. While I was there, I interned at Tampa Bay Watch. And this was um, a place that was trying to restore Tampa Bay. So they had a couple different programs. I worked with building oyster domes, which are which is this right here. It's made out of concrete. Um, so we would make those and we'd put them at different restoration sites around Tampa Bay and it really helped to cut down erosion, especially on channels. Um, and also it attracted oysters, as you can see, all right here, clumped up onto the oyster dome. Another program that I worked with there was growing Spartina, which is salt marsh in the middle schools and the high schools. So the kids would go out and they would be in charge of growing the Spartina in um, the greenhouses. And then when there was a restoration project, we'd bring all the kids and the Spartina that they grew and plant it to restore the marsh. So like Jacob said, I moved here in 2009 after I graduated school. I did the seasonal thing. I worked a lot um, during the summer and then in the winter I decided to go traveling down to Central America where it was nice and warm. Um, so I did that for a couple years and then um, once 
I got hired full time here, I ended up staying year round. Um, so one of the internships that I did while I was traveling um, was at the Cape Eleuthera Institute, which is in Eleuthera, a small island in the Bahamas. And what we did is we grew cobia, which is a pelagic fish. You can find it south of Virginia, all around the Gulf Coast. Um, they can reach up to about six feet long. And we grew them in the lab. We got the, the small fish sent to us from the University of Miami. And we would do some feed um, experiments on them to see which feed was better. And these fish grow really fast. So they have a good feed um, to growth ratio. So this is cobia right here. And this is the offshore cage that we stocked with cobia. So once they got to a certain size, they were put into this offshore cage where they could free swim, they were away from predators, and they would get fed a couple of times a day, um, and then eventually they would be harvested. I interned for the Natural Resources in 2012 and 2013. So the first year I was here and during the summer for about three months, and I was working at the Brant Point Shellfish Hatchery, where we grow scallops um, and clams for stock enhancement. And then the next summer I got hired as the water quality intern, which was a six month program, and we did water quality on a bunch of uh, Nantucket water bodies. In, San, uh, in 2012, I ended up traveling with Tara Riley, who's a shellfish biologist, and we went to Zanzibar, which is a small island off of Tanzania in, in Africa. And there we worked at a hatchery where we um, taught three of the men that were there about proper uh, hatchery techniques, so what you, can, what you do to make a hatchery run. And the main goal was to grow this shellfish right here. It's called a blood arc, and they actually have hemoglobin in them, so if you open them up, they are bloody. We do have them in Nantucket. Um, I don't know anyone that eats them, but in Zanzibar, they do eat them. So the main goal was to spawn the blood arcs, raise the larvae, and then raise them to a certain size, which then would be given to women in the village and they had little plots in the water. Um, the tides are really drastic there, so at low tide, everything was exposed, but it looked like they had like little gardens there where they would plant the blood arcs, let them grow to a certain size, and then be able to harvest them and sell them to make a living. Um, it was a great experience. It's so different over there than it is here. Um, I'm really happy that I went there and got the experience to do that. In the winter of 2013, I commercially scalloped for the first time. It is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> it is so tough. Um, you definitely need some upper body, body strength, which by the end of the season I did have, but um, we'd go out there, you know, you have to be down at the boat at 6 a.m., be able to start scalloping at 6.30. The wind's blowing, it's cold, um, but it was a great experience. I went out with Andy Roberts, who is, I think he's been scalloping for 30 plus years. Um, he's a great guy, and so I did that. It was a great experience. I can tell now, um, distinguish between different scallops, like what's a nub, what's a classic, what's seed, so that was really great to be able to do. Okay, so a little background about the natural resources. Today I'll be talking to you about the shell recycling program and oyster restoration. We also have the Brant Point Shellfish Hatchery, which is right on Brant Point. If you're not familiar with it, it's a building that looks like a Coast Guard building, but it's not, it's right on the beach. And there we grow bay scallops and cohogs for stock enhancement and we're also growing oysters as well. Um, this summer we did do, well not us, but we hired some people to do eelgrass mapping so we can have a baseline of what our eelgrass population is and be able to compare it throughout the years. We also monitor protected species, so piping plovers, um, I'm sure you all know about them. <laughs> uh, 
We're also part of the Conservation Commission, which is made up of seven members, and they review and permit activities within 100 feet of wetlands. We also have natural resources enforcement, so J.C. Johnson is the warden. He, he'll go out and check scallops, make sure no one's taking seed. And then the water quality initiative, which we um, do water quality in four of the ponds, Nantucket Harbor and Madiket Harbor. We also test the bathing beaches in the summer to make sure that they're safe for swimming. And um, we also do the pond openings, so Hummock Pond and Sacagawea Pond. All right, so to get into the shell recycling program, the oyster shell recycling program encourages local restaurants, raw bars, oyster growers, and the community to save and recycle oyster shells in order to support oyster restoration in Nantucket Harbors. So that's just kind of what our main goal is. It focuses on reducing waste, so instead of throwing the shells in the trash, which then goes to the landfill, you can never recover, we're saving the shell. It recycles a valuable, limited resource. So because for so many years people have been throwing out oyster shell, um, it's really hard to find now. It's definitely a limited resource, and if you do want to find it, it's pretty expensive to purchase. It also provides an opportunity for the community to participate in a sustainable movement. So by eating oysters at a restaurant that is participating in the program and recycles the shell, you are then putting out habitat, or eventually will be putting out habitat for oysters to grow on and help the ecosystem in Nantucket waters. And as I said before, the first two years were funded by the Shellfish Association. So we have four main objectives. The first is to generate a community-based supply of shell. The second is um, for oyster and quahog shells to be returned to the harbor for pH buffering and settlement substrate purposes. So this is from the Shellfish Management Plan, which the town adopted in October of 2012. And setting up a shell recycling program was a high priority in that plan. Um, fortunately, I was able to establish the program back in 2014, and um, it has been pretty successful for the last two years. The third objective is to construct a small oyster reef using all of the reclaimed shell that we have gained from the past two years, and then public outreach. So to educate the community about oyster restoration and about shell recycling, why it's such a valuable resource and all the benefits that oyster restoration comes with. And shell recycling um, programs have been becoming more prevalent because people are realizing that it is a limited resource, that we need to do something and get the oyster population um, on the increase instead of on the decline. So you can find um, shell recycling in like Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina. Some places actually offer a tax break for participants. Um, I don't think Massachusetts has yet, but I've heard that they are proposing one. <laughs> Okay, so how does shell recycling and oyster restoration work? So you have, you harvest the oysters, they get sold to the restaurant. After the oysters are eaten, their shells are discarded onto land. And then the shucked oyster shells are reclaimed for use in oyster reef restoration projects. And recycled oysters are placed back into the water to replenish and restore reefs. So they have to cure, in Massachusetts, they have to cure on land for at least one year. Um, that's due to the Division of Marine Fisheries. They have a shellfish planting guideline, and they recommend that you have them on land for at least one year. This is to make sure that um, if there are disease or parasites in the shell, that it all gets killed before putting, being put back in the water. Because oysters are coming from the West Coast, Canada, they're not all coming from Nantucket, so if there was a disease in Canada, we don't want it in Nantucket waters. We don't want it to disrupt the ecosystem here. So this year we have um, about 27 participants. Last year we had 18 participants. Um, they are made up of restaurants and robbers. 
So to name a few, we have Crew, uh, the Languedoc, Dune, 167 Raw, which is a raw bar, Toppers, but they're all up there. And I went, so the first year I went to the restaurants and asked them if they wanted to participate. It's a free program for them. Um, they, you know, it's just another thing that they have to recycle on Nantucket. So a lot of them were, they were fine with it. They were reducing their waste to the landfill and they were helping with the sustainable movement. So all of them um, have been participating in the last couple years and I educated them about what our goals are, um, what our end goal is to have an oyster reef in Nantucket and they were, um, they were really into it, which was great. They were very supportive. So this is an informational rack card that I had made up. I wanted to get the word out about the program, so I tried to think of ideas how to do it, and I thought this would be a great one. So the front just talks about um, what the shell recycling program is and what the goal is. And then on the back, we have why are you recycling shell? So it says um, a couple of different bullet points and then how you as a community member can help with the program as well. And it has my contact information on the bottom too in case anyone has questions. Um, but I, I handed out these to all of the restaurants and the raw bars and it was a nice way for them to um, educate their customers about the program. So a lot of them put it in the bill collector so while their credit card was getting run, they could read about the program and learn of how the restaurant that they were eating or the oysters that they were eating are gonna be used to grow more oysters in the future. I also gave all the restaurants and raw bars um, stickers of the Shell Recycling logo, and a lot of them have put it in their windows to show their customers that they are participating in the sustainable movement. Um, so it's, it's proven to be a good way to kind of get the word out. And we also have um, blue five gallon recycling buckets and also big 32 gallon blue buckets. So the process is, we go pick up the shell, we weigh the shell and record it in a notebook, so at the end of the season I can let all of the restaurants and raw bar bars know how much shell they've contributed throughout the season. Then the shell gets dumped at the DPW in an open air concrete bin where it will cure for one year for the sun to get to it and make sure all the tissue is killed off before the shells are returned. We bring the buckets back and clean them, and then we return clean buckets to the restaurants. And we pick up seven days a week in July and August. Um, we also will pick up, if some restaurants open in the winter in February and they're selling oysters, I'll go there and pick up shell if they have it. So it's really a year-round program, but you'll see in a couple of slides that it's definitely seasonal. Um, there's a difference between you know, February and July, obviously. This is the shell pile from 2014, so last year's pile. Um, as you can see at the DPW, it's an open air concrete bin, so we just try to layer the oyster shells. Um, this picture just shows all the shells pushed up into one pile, but now they are right here at the old DPW um, entrance. So they're spread out pretty thin, so the site can reach a lot, of, a lot more of them. And our shell will be cured for more than one year, um, other than the, what the DMF suggests. So it'll be cured for probably two, two plus years, which is uh, definitely a good thing. And then this is the shell pile from this year. It doesn't look as big as 2014, but it is about 50, uh, 5,500 pounds larger. So this year, I didn't have the shells all pushed up into one pile. I had them, we kind of just layered them, um, but the shell pile will get turned over every couple months to make sure that the bottom shells do get sun. So this year we collected uh, 33,935.4 pounds, which is um, about 15 and a half metric tons. 
Oh, and I forgot to mention, last year we collected about 28,000 pounds. So this just breaks down the shell poundage by month. Um, in January, we got no shells. But then, as you can see, as the summer progressed, um, in July we got 9,629, and then in October so far, we've gotten 711 shells. And this picture is what our blue buckets look like. So a lot of people will see them around town and can see that the logo's on it and that the, there are shells in there um, being recycled. This picture shows the oyster life cycle. Um, so we have female and male oysters. They release egg and sperm into the water column. They then get fertilized and end up being free swimming larvae for about two to three weeks. When they grow this black spot right here, they're called eye larvae, and that means that they're ready to attach to a suitable substrate and metamorphosize into adulthood. So then they do that, they become spat, they attach to the shell, and oyster larvae is chemically attracted to oyster shell. That's um, the main reason why we are collecting oysters. We are collecting cohogs as well, but oysters are the number one suitable substrate. They will attach to other shellfish, um, scallops, cohogs. I've also heard that they've attached to a tire in the water one time. Um, but the oyster shell, that's, that's a suitable one. So they'll attach to that shell and that's where they'll be for the rest of their life. Oysters naturally will kind of clump together. So that's, that's the main reason why we are collecting oyster shell. This map shows the worldwide decline in oyster and oysters and oyster habitat. So the blue, they're good habitat. So that's around Brazil and Argentina. And then you can see most of the world either has fair to functionally extinct oyster beds. Um, and a lot of reasons why oysters are on the decline is either due to years of overharvesting, either poor water quality, not putting the shell back into the water so they don't have that suitable substrate to attach to, um, to go through metamorphosis so then they end up dying, or even sedimentation through storms and stuff. If the oysters get smothered, they'll end up dying as well and disease. Um, a lot of the Chesapeake oysters, they got either MSX or Dermo and ended up um, depleting that population. So oysters on Nantucket, um, the yellow pins are present oysters that you can find and then the red pins are um, where oysters used to be in the past and that's either through anecdotal evidence um, or some biological reports from years ago. So you can see that they used to be all over the Monomoy Creeks and in the town area by the wharfs in Shimo, Pulpus Harbor, also heard um, on Kotu, and now you can find them in Sacagawea Pond, um, from the, the leases, which the aquaculture leases, which I'll talk about in the next couple slides. Um, there's people growing oysters up in the head of the harbor and in Cascada. And then you can also find some oysters attached um, in the Easy Street Basin on all those rocks between the steamship and the High Line. There's oysters there. And last year, I actually found some on the jetties attached to the rocks there. So there are eight aquaculture growers in Nantucket, and they grow at the head of the harbor, Cascada, and also in, um, right outside of Pulpus. What they do is they, um, they get oysters from a hatchery, um, usually a hatchery in Maine, but you can get it from any state qualified hatchery. And they get them when they're really small, and they're single oysters. So, like I said before, oysters clump together when they grow naturally. Uh, that's not great for being sold on the half shell. 
So they got set on, it's called microculch. It's basically um, really fine oyster shell that's ground up. It, it looks like sand, um, but it allows for one oyster to set on one piece of microculch, allowing for that single oyster. So they grow in oyster grow cages, or there's some other techniques, bottom culture, et cetera. Um, and there are two, so they order either diploids, which, um, are, which can spawn, or they order triploids, which are somewhat sterile, and they end up growing faster because they're not putting their energy into spawning in the summer. So I put this picture in because it's an oyster grow cage. It's what a lot of the men up at the head of the harbor are using. So this black area is a float and it's attached to this cage. It has six bags in it filled with oysters. So you flip the cage over so these are out of the water. It allows the oysters to float in the water column where the algae is you know, nice and dense and they can grow pretty fast. Um, so during the spring, summer, and a little bit into the fall, if you go up there, you'll see cages like this. But when it becomes winter time, there's lots of storms. They don't want their gear to get tangled or the oysters to, to end up dying. So they flip the cage over. So this is the float area. You take off one of these caps and it fills with water. So then it sinks down to the bottom and they're, um, you know, they're safer than being up where all the wave energy is. And you can find Nantucket oysters at lots of local restaurants. Um, they do, you know, when they order the little babies, they order 100,000, probably more, and then every year they're ordering those little guys, so it's a ton of work that they're doing. They're out there every day sorting the oysters and making sure that the gear is okay. So this map shows oyster restoration in the United States. Um, you know, scientists were realizing that oysters are a keystone species and that their populations were pretty low. Um, so they wanted to bring the populations back up because there's so many eco benefits to oyster restoration. So basically all over the coastal United States, there are oyster restoration projects. And then in New England, you can see that some in Maine, we have some in Massachusetts and Wellfleet, Martha's Vineyard, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York. Um, so they're, be they're becoming more prevalent. It's kind of like an easy fix for helping water quality and restoring this keystone species, which then restores other species. A couple of the benefits of oyster restoration is that it improves water quality. So the oysters can filter between 30 and 50 gallons of water a day, which is pretty incredible. So it eats the algae, which contains nitrogen, and then it uses that nitrogen to grow either their tissue or their shell, or they release it as feces. The feces then go into the sediment and then microbes convert it to nitrogen gas, so it helps with reducing nitrogen inputs into the water. It also allows eelgrass to grow, so by them being such great filters, it lowers their turbidity. So and during storms, you know how the water gets really murky from sand and other material that's in it? The oysters filter that water and then allow that sedimentation to kind of um, go back to where it came from and allows the water to be clear for, which then allows light penetration to increase and then eelgrass growth. It prevents ocean acidification on a local level. So by putting the oyster shells back into the water, they're made out of calcium carbonate, excuse me, which is basic. So as the ocean becomes more acidic, they kind of counteract that, um, that, that the lower, um, sorry, so prevents ocean acidification. So by putting the shells back in the water, which is basic, it helps neutralize that, um, the ocean acidification. And 
I'll make another point. For the oyster shells, they're really thick. So when you put them in the water, that's another reason why we're recycling the shell because if we had scallop shells, they kind of disintegrate in a couple years, but oyster shells, they'll stick around for a while, which is a good base for the restoration project. The reefs act as habitat for many different species. So lots of juvenile fish will come in there and as they get older, they'll go to the open ocean. There'll be crabs, other shellfish. Um, so it really helps, it's an ecosystem within itself. There's tons of different species there. It also can act as a shoreline buffer against erosion. So during big storms, the waves will break onto the reef before it reaches the shore. So it helps stabilize the shore. So I'm gonna go into the hatchery phase of oyster restoration, which we'll be using on Nantucket. Um, if you're down south and there's lots of natural oysters in the water, they have it easy. You basically just put the shell back in the water. There's so many little um, oyster larvae in the water that they'll just attach the shell. But here in Nantucket, because we don't have a ton of um, oysters, uh, we need to do this hatchery phase. So. What you do is you, you get broodstock, which um, is mature oysters around like three years old, and you put them on a table. You heat up the water to a certain temperature and that will release, have them release either egg or sperm. And then we collect the egg, egg and sperm separately so then we can manually fertilize the eggs. Um, we have a ratio, <laughs> a ratio for that. So once the egg and sperm is collected, the eggs get fertilized after 24 hours. And this is pictures of oyster larvae. So we keep the larvae in the hatchery for about 21 days in larval tanks. We have to drain down the water every other day. We catch the larvae, we clean it, we clean their tanks, we fill up, fill up their tanks with filtered seawater, and then put the larvae back in. And we also grow algae, which we feed to them, so they eat a lot of food. <laughs> so step three is rec reclaimed shell is packaged into mesh bags, and this again serves as that suitable substrate for the larvae to attach to. So the tanks are filled with filtered seawater and heated up to about 90 degrees. The larvae is poured into the tank and then usually within three days, the larvae will attach to the oyster shell. So this is a picture of oyster shells with little baby oysters on it. There's a ton. And for some reason, they all kind of like clump together when they settle. So we keep the, those bags of shell with the oyster spat on it in, in the lab for probably one to two weeks. And then we put them into this outside tank where it just filters or just brings in water from the harbor. Um, and that allows us not to have to feed them all that algae, there's natural algae in the harbor water. So it's just running through that tank and the oysters can eat without, um, and you know, no predators are there. So they're just there eating and growing. And then step seven would be that that spat on shell is then moved to whatever designated restoration site area you have. Um, so you have the reclaimed shell, dispersed in that water, and then on top of it, you put the shell with the, with the oyster spat on it to start the reef. We have a potential site, which is right here um, in Shimo area, but there are um, a lot of steps for before you just throw the shell back in the water. We have permitting, and there are So I also want to do more dive surveys of the area. So to have an area approved, there can't be eelgrass, there can't be other shellfish um, around it. 
and kind of just has to be like a dead area, unfortunately. Um, so dive surveys for that. We have to have the Division of Marine Fisheries come out and also do dive surveys. Um, growth and mortality studies. So I have four cages out in the harbor right now. I'm studying their growth at different locations. I want to put out spat collectors, which um, will attract whatever natural spat we have in the water to see if the reef will be able to self-sustain itself like after a couple of years. Predator studies to see what predators are in the water. Um, hopefully all the oysters that we put out there won't get killed. We're gonna uh, do some water quality monitoring. So this summer we collected water quality from, um, from the different sites and we'll have that as our baseline along the, the years. And then of course we need to continue to collect shell. So this is just more about the growth studies. I ordered 30,000 two millimeter oysters. They're really small. Um, and then we put them into this, it's called a FLUPSI. It's a floating upwaller system. So it has a pump at the end. It draws the water out of this trough and then allows water to come up through these silos and continue in this loop. And that really allows the oysters to grow super fast. This map just shows the four different locations where I have the cages out. So Old North Wharf, Shimo, Quays-ish area, Ducks Home, and then in Pulpis. And then this is the permitting process. There's lots of permits to be obtained. Um, so from the Division of Marine Fisheries, I mean an aquaculture permit, and then the dive surveys. The Army Corps, we have to get permits for them for putting fill, which is the shell, into the water. Um, we have to get it approved by the Board of Selectmen and have a public hearing. And then get it approved by the Conservation Commission as well and the Mass DEP. And hopefully there'll be oyster restoration coming to Nantucket waters soon. Um, this is an oyster that, it, it's dead, but we found it in Pulpus Harbor. It was huge. Um, and then these are just oysters, those same little oysters that I showed you before, these are the uh, maybe a month or so ago. So they're growing really, really fast. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming out and listening about this program, the Shellfish Association for funding the program, the Department of Public Works for allowing us to store all the shell out there and turning it over every couple months, and then all of the participating restaurants and raw bars, and the Historical Association. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions in the audience? Um, yeah, yes. The, um, when you said 90 degrees, you have to heat up the water 90 degrees for them to actually, I guess, incubate or whatever. Mm -hmm. Isn't that extremely, doesn't that seem weird to you? Um, it doesn't seem weird. It definitely is a lot warmer than base scallops. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we just put a heater into the tanks and heated up the water. It, it's between 85 and 90, so anywhere in between there, that allows them to to set onto the gulch. And the um, the other question is, when the scallop shells that everybody dumps, they used to dump the jetties on them, so yeah. uh, they used two or just the, I know you've talked about the difference, they break down faster. Yeah, we last year we used the scallop shells because we didn't have the reclaimed shell when we did spot oysters and set them. So they will set on scallop shell, but, um, the scallop shells are used for either road work or um, whatever. We, we don't use them for this purpose, but because they disintegrate so fast compared to oyster shells. Could you just get your microphone? <laughs> um, so you said, how fast did you say the larvae when they were ready to settle would settle on the shells? Was it? So it's between three days and a week, but um, all the experts that I talked to said if they don't settle within three days, then they probably won't attach to that substrate. I just was curious because I've read that a lot of marine invertebrate larvae need to have like, you know, their substrate already have some bacteria, some sort of slime on it first. Do you think 
oyster larvae don't need that? No, they definitely need that. We put the shells in the tanks 24 hours before and filled it up with seawater so they could get that bacteria on it. Um, I have a question about oyster diseases. Mm -hmm. When you collect the oysters and put them in the cement holding area out at the dump, do you sample it at all for oyster diseases? Um, so we haven't yet, but because we haven't put any shell back into the water. Um, but the Division of Marine Fisheries, they do recommend that you keep it on land for at least one year to ensure that if there are diseases, like all the tissue is decomposed. Um, so our shells will, will be on land for two years or even more. So um, we will probably sample a couple shells to get that, um, to, if, you know, if there is anything, but I'm, I'm hopeful that there won't be any um, after that two years being on land. A second question. And that is, does the state of Massachusetts or the New England area have rules about which kind of oysters and from where we can import them? For shells or? For disease control. Um, not that I know of, but I can definitely research more on that topic and get back to you. Any others? Uh, I have a quick question. Oh, yes. Do we have any idea what the success rate might be of this new program? Um, so we spawned oysters in August, and from we had about four million larvae, and then we had two hundred and fifty thousand set onto the shell. So it's about a sixteen percent set rate, and anything above ten is is good. So hopefully, um, in the next couple of years, we'll better our techniques and be able to get that set rate up. I remember in the late 40s in Chincoteague, it was high, spicy high, a lot of shotgun houses. And two or three years ago, and they're not up there. They still put, they were putting those right back out in the water. That was the 50s. Are they still going down there in the bay? I'm sorry, what? In the bay. In Chesapeake Bay, I'm sorry. Are they recycling shell or? Yeah. yeah. Yep, they have recycling programs there. Because they had tons of them that were putting out back then. The, the oyster guys would be hauling them in and then be, at the end of the season they're taking them back out. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I know uh, Maryland has a recycling program. Are they taking back just that, you're just tossing them back in? Yours or were they so in the. No, they were just dumping them back that's, in. That's yeah, what I yeah. thought. Do these go in in bags, like you have them in that? In so that? to set the oysters, yeah. we put them in the bags okay, because it's easy to transport, but um, to put the rest of the shell that hasn't been used to set the oysters, those won't be in bags, they'll just be spread out. Fantastic, are there any others? Well, thank you so much, Leah. Oh, sorry, Sarah. <laughs> Can, do you mind asking into the mic? Yeah. Um, this might be a silly question. More than likely, if I eat oysters, it'll be at a restaurant. But if I have them at home, is there somewhere I can drop off my shell? Yeah, um, our office is down at 2 Bailing Beach Road. It's the building right in front of the tennis courts at Jetty's. And I always have buckets out there. So you can put them in a bucket or come knock on the door and tell me that you have oysters, and I'll be happy to pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Today. Appreciate it. And we hope to see you all next week. Thanks very much. Thank you.